Hi all, welcome along to the CELPS Online Learning on Libraries, on San libraries of Sanctuary. Uh, in the week since we organised this CELPS Online Learning, it has become as timely and as important as ever to highlight the role cultural institutions like libraries and museums can play in Sanctuary. Around the world, more people than ever are being forced to flee conflict, changing climates, environmental degradation and persecution to find safety and sanctuary elsewhere. Libraries welcome people seeking sanctuary and other new arrivals into the community and seek to foster a culture of welcome and inclusivity, and that is what we will hear about today. We're delighted to be joined by Ashley Beckett and Gunn Organ from the City of Sanctuary, John Vincent, coordinator of the network and author of Facet's upcoming book, Libraries and Sanctuary, Supporting Refugees and Other New Arrivals, and Delan Fotui, a founding member of Refugees for Justice in Glasgow. John will start things today with what Libraries of Sanctuary are, are, are about and the resource pack he's designed. Then Ashley will go into a bit more detail about the application process for anyone that's interested. And then Delan, along with Gunn, will talk about the difference the Mitchell Library made to him when he first arrived in Glasgow. Um, we'll come to questions at the end and we, we look forward to, to hearing any thoughts that anyone has on that. Okay, so thanks all, and I hope you enjoy this. Um, John, can I hand over to you now, please, if you want to start uh, sharing your screen and then take it away whenever you are ready. Can people see that okay? Uh, no, nothing's appeared yet. Oh, okay. I've got it here if you want me to, to share it for you. That's us, I think we're sharing now. Great, sorry, it's always that thing where they, every time I come to use it, everything's moved around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so everything was in a different place again. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm really um, delighted to be taking part in this morning. Um, as you said, Sean, it's really timely. Um, and I just think um, there's so much we need to talk about, so much we need to get through. Um, I'm going to speak um, fairly quickly and briefly uh, because I'd, I'd rather we had time to discuss. Um, what I just also wanted to say was it's terrific there are so many of you here and I just glimpsed lots of um, contacts and friends and people I've talked to before um, in the room so um, hopefully we might catch up through chat. So this is what I'm going to try and talk about today. I want to start by talking very briefly about why libraries and libraries of sanctuary are so important in 2022. Um, Sorry, I don't really need to say this, um, but the key issue, obviously, is right now um, the war in Ukraine and the issues that we're seeing on the news, on our media um, every moment uh, about the migration issues that this has thrown up. Um, and there's a link to the next point. Um, I'll, again, I won't um, spend a lot of time on this. Um, you can come back to me and we can talk about it in the chat or in the questions if you want to. Um, we've seen um, during the last two weeks, um, the response from the UK government um, has been, what's the right word? Mixed, I think will probably be a polite word for it. Um, there's a huge issue, uh, which I'm sure you know about, but I'll just touch on here, uh, which is that since about 2006, um, the UK government has been pursuing what it's called a hostile environment. Um, so trying to make it as difficult as possible uh, for people to reach and settle in the UK. And we're seeing that playing out in the frankly appalling scenes that we got. I saw the, um, the breakfast news this morning on television uh, and they had a reporter talking to people who are trying to get visa um, applications in and being sent all over Europe to actually apply. And it's kind of part of the whole scene. So um, libraries are one of the places where people can try and find and access um, information and help and support. And we'll come on to that during the morning. Clearly Brexit and its after effects are having an impact. People who are arriving here need information, advice, support, signposting, somewhere to go, somewhere to meet. And I think libraries can provide all of those. 
What we can provide is a warm welcome. And I think one of the big issues that's coming through really strongly is how libraries are, are stepping up to this and starting to provide even more of a warm welcome than they've ever done. We can signpost people to local services and help them settle into a new area. We can provide access to email and the internet. Of course, we provide a range of books and other resources, but we provide spaces, spaces for people to meet, spaces for classes such as um, English second language classes to take place. And we should be providing a, space, a safe space for people to meet and to be. And we provide much more. I wanted just very quickly to touch on how the resource pack um, that um, I was involved in producing um, came about, uh, just because it's interesting where it's come from, it gives you a bit of background as to what, where it's come from, where it's going. So Libraries Connected West Midlands, so the, um, the regional library connected group in, in England, uh, wanted to build on the work that had been carried out at Thimble Mill Library in Sandwell, which was the UK's first library of sanctuary. And it set up a working group to steer development, including, for example, Arts Council England, City of Sanctuary, um, Libraries Connected, and library services from across the West Midlands. Um, they commissioned me to produce a pack, and although um, my, my hand was behind it, so to speak, um, it's truly a collaborative effort by all these organisations and the public libraries across the UK um, who've supported, um, helped, given me case studies, given me examples, and when we did a revision of it in October, um, it sent me all sorts of up-to-date um, news and information so I could keep it current. Um, what the pack includes is an introduction to Sanctuary, and Ashley's going to talk a lot more about this in a minute. Uh, Libraries of Sanctuary, the why, what and how. Background information on seeking Sanctuary. Um, something about the library and information needs of new arrivals. A brief look at the barriers that they face and how we, as people working in libraries and information, can start to overcome the barriers. And then a look at resources, including library related resources and also key organizations that we might want to signpost to or that we can link up to, to get further information for ourselves. There it is. Uh, well, there it isn't, but that, that, that's what it looks like. Um, revised edition came out in 2021 and the web link is there um, if you want to um, access it. Um, it really is a good starting point if you're looking at this kind of work. And there are contact details. So I coordinate the network, which is a network of libraries, archives, museums and galleries and individuals that work around social justice. And we've got a website and there's more information there. I really am happy to hear from people um, with questions, comments, um, anything anyone wants to follow up, case studies, examples. Uh, my email address is there. Do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, as um, Sean said in his introduction, um, I am in the final stages of writing a book um, for Facet Publishing on libraries and new arrivals um, and looking at sanctuary and all kinds of libraries. So again, if people did want to get in touch, that would be terrific. Uh, but I'm, ho I'm hoping to get the draft in by the end of March. And finally, there's a GISC mail, an email list uh, for people interested in libraries and museums of sanctuary and the address is there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That, that, that's fantastic. And uh, we've been putting the, the links to, to the resource packs and, and, and other information websites and your, your email address in the chat. Um, we, we'll you. hear all of this this after the event with everyone who has signed up as well. So don't worry if anyone um, hasn't taken a note of things, you will get it all, all after this. Brilliant. Um, Thanks, Sean. Thanks, John. Really appreciate that. Um, so next up, we have Ashley Beckett from City of Sanctuary. Um, Ashley, if you want to just uh, start sharing your screen and then just uh, take away your part whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks. 
Sorry, just a second. All right, can everyone see that one? Great. Um, I want to first say hello to everyone and apologize for I'm getting at the tail end of a cold. So bear with me if I have to pause for a drink of water or something along those lines. So I thought I would take you first through a little introduction to City of Sanctuary and the work that we do and then kind of break down um, the resource or the, the Sanctuary Award for libraries. Uh, John gave a great like genesis of Libraries of Sanctuaries, its origin story, and why we think it's so important to be part of the work that we do. Um, so City of Sanctuary is a UK-wide movement. We're based on creating welcome and belonging, and we do this through several different ways. We have local groups that work on um, different aspects of welcome, from service providing to advocacy and different parts all around the UK. We have um, sanctuary ambassadors that are people with lived experience in seeking sanctuary that um, advocate for uh, welcome within the UK. And then we have our stream work, uh, which libraries is one of a, a portfolio of different uh, mainstream institutions that can get an award of sanctuary saying that they're dedicated to creating welcome around the UK. So we look at ourselves as an organization, a multiple a network and a movement. And so as an organization, we're we're quite small as a UK wide organization. Um, there's just a few staff that are diligently supporting groups around the country and different um, institutions. And that's kind of like our meat is that we see ourselves as this kind of networking agency that's able to help uh, groups in different regions connect, share best practices and grow. And that's where the libraries network and and the Libraries Award is really important for libraries around the country to be able to share the programming that they do. And all of that is part of creating this movement of welcome and belonging for people that are seeking sanctuary that are in the UK. Um, I'm just putting this up there briefly. Um, it's available on our website. It's kind of our, our, our theory for change is that we believe that social contact, so engaging with individuals and making those relationships can create a bigger movement. Um, and we do that kind of through both on the micro level of individuals providing services and support and to a macro level of participating in campaigns and around the country. Um, and that's where libraries come in as they kind of are in both realms. Um, so we provide support and resources for, for these and networking opportunities for the different groups and organizations. Uh, we don't do any direct service providing to people seeking sanctuary, but we oftentimes through our groups know where to direct people. So often we pass on service looking sanctuary seekers to different groups and organizations for support. Libraries are great for that because they also know what's available in the community. And then the other side is the sanctuary awards, which is the ability for um, institutions and organizations to say that we're also part of this movement. And we also believe that welcome and belonging is important for all people within the UK. Um, we see the sanctuary award as a strategic tool to engage the, the public um, and to kind of share best practical um, best practices across different institutions and to share our vision of welcome. Um, we recognize them and celebrate them and we share them around the greater community. It's very exciting to have different um, institutions become awards. In my role as London coordinator right now, I have a cafe, a food bank, a theater, a library, and a school all working to be awarded. And that just shows how much the community wants to support people seeking sanctuary. And then our award is based on our, our methodology of it's kind of a three pillar learn, embed, and share. So like the first pillar is understanding what issues may face people seeking sanctuary and understanding what that means for your institution and how you can provide that support. And then embedding it across your programs, whether it's um, in your, your plans for the next coming years, or it's just literally the services you provide and then sharing that work with the greater community, one through us and having us help share it across our platforms, as well as sharing it amongst library networks or in your local community of the people that visit your library. And then there's specific criteria for different streams. Um, 
we try to keep the criteria a bit broad because we want each institution to be able to tailor it for what they actually do and what they see their community needs. So just for a quick look, these are all the different streams that there are, and we're also not opposed to creating awards for things that may not fall on this list under our general award place of sanctuary. So there's arts and gardens and libraries and museums and shops and festivals, and it's constantly growing. Schools is, is a very prolific one across the country. I think there's like 300 schools at the moment that are schools of sanctuary as well as universities are constantly growing. So just quickly, some of the benefits of being a library of sanctuary is it helps extend the reach of the library as part of the process. You'll kind of have a look at your community and where there are people that you can engage with, maybe sanctuary seekers or partners that work with sanctuary seekers that may be able to come within the library. Um, like I said, strengthening those partnerships. Um, and it, it, one of the things that I've always thought about libraries is they really are like the last bastion of a community hub. People go there not just for books, they go there for the internet or they go there for community or for book clubs or to ask for help for information. And it's really just a really important connecting place in communities and seeing those places as places of sanctuary and welcome is really important, I think. Um, and the fact that libraries do have a lot of government information and are able to share that with new arrivals that may not know where else to look. Whoops, I went the wrong way. So the process, so like I said, it's there's the learn about the people seeking sanctuary, embedding those concepts into your programming and then sharing those with the greater community. Those are like the three pillars of the award. And then the, those pillars can be met through different criteria and I think that's what yeah so just some of those criteria like I said it's quite broad the resource pack has a bit more of a breakdown for each of these criteria and at the end of the powerpoint when they send that around there's a, a another slide that goes into a bit more detail that I've just put on the end for reference um, that'll have a little bit more detail about this criteria so training staff is really important and that could be anything from training staff about uh, refugee issues or people seeking sanctuary issues to um, traumas they may face and understanding what that is, but it could also just be training staff on what resources you have that they can offer to people when people come in and, and need to access some government document, just making sure staff knows where to access those things. Um, and to consult with other libraries and learn from the community and participate with the partners that are also active in your community. And then part of the embedding is um, signing the, the organizational support pledge saying that your library system is um, in support of creating welcome and sanctuary. Uh, typically you designate a staff that is kind of the person that is managing that relationship and can come to the different networking meetings and things like that. And then doing what you can in your in your library to create a welcoming and sharing environment for asylum seekers. Um, we ask for you to develop a three year plan or at least give us some ideas of what programming you would like to see happen in the three years. It doesn't have to be like an official plan of engagement because I know that can always change. Um, just kind of as to see that this is uh, becoming a bigger program within the library and then actively engaging in your wider community. So showing how you're connecting to people seeking sanctuary. Um, and if there aren't any in your direct physical community, maybe it's by participating in conversations like this or sharing your best practices with other libraries and things like that. So making the public commitment is like signing our pledge as well as putting the logo on uh, the website and materials and around the library that it is a library of sanctuary, sharing best practices within the platform and promoting and celebrating Refugee Week, which can be through various of things of different activities that your library does, or it could be as simple as 
a sign board that says it's refugee week here are some books that are about welcome or seeking sanctuary or migration and things like that so it can really depend on the library size and scope and what they specialize in so this is the the steps for applying um, this is all on our website that i think goon already shared and you can click through it as well um, so first you can there's also, I think a great way is to pledge your commitment. And through that pledge, we then will connect you with your local group and regional coordinator. Um, and then from there, they'll take you through the process. The first thing I always say is to kind of do a self-assessment of, of what, the, what the library is already doing and how you can um, use the programming you're already doing within the criteria for the award. Um, and then once you've filled out that assessment rubric, then you can see what you need to add or what you need to work on in order to build a full application and then you submit a written application digitally to either myself or your regional coordinator who then passes it on to me um, and then once that is in we would do a process of um, i would have a conversation with you and give feedback and then we would do an assessment panel which likely will involve a, a site visit, uh, which could be remotely or through somebody local that just comes and meets with you to see the library. And then we have the assessment and then the award is given. And the award is for three years and then we do a, a brief reaccreditation after three years to hear what you've been doing and what you plan to continue to do. So one thing that I think is really important as the libraries award has grown is oftentimes it's not just one library it's like a library system for a borough or something wants to apply as one and I think that's that's really possible to do and I, I encourage it rather than having one-off applications for each library in a in a system and that it's easy to do in scale because you can do staff training across the system you can have refugee week activities that vary depending on the size of the library we don't expect a small rural library that has no contact with asylum seekers to have the exact same programming as a main hub library in the middle of an area that has a lot of asylum seeker activity. So we, we also are willing to work with you and see how that programming works for your place. And it could be having a book collection that promotes welcome, everything from children's books to adult books and having a refugee week display, or it could be really robust programming like story times and ESL uh, language groups and all sorts of stuff. So it's really adaptable to what your library does and how you can include asylum seekers in that process. So some of the frequently asked questions are, there's no application fee, but donations are always welcome. We're a very small organization with uh, very little funding. Um, and so growing this sector would is very important to us and that comes with donations to increase hours and work like that all libraries are welcome to apply depending on types sizes and the demographic of the people that they they service and i'm always happy to have a conversation with a library if they don't know how they fit what their programming does into the the refugee sector or the idea of welcome and like i said it lasts three years with accreditation reaccreditation and we're quite when you do your application you have to talk about what programs you're actively doing and we're quite flexible with that right now because we know over the course of COVID a lot of programming has had to be cut libraries were closed or only for book drop off and pick up and so you can talk about programming from prior to, to COVID and programming that you're hoping to re-initiate now that libraries can open in full capacity. Yep, so that's that's all for me. Um, my email's here. I'm sure it'll be circulated more. I'm always happy to do a short call with anybody that just wants to have a little discussion and see how their library fits. So send me an email and we can schedule that. And I look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, Ashley. That, that, that was brilliant and really informative. Thank you so much. And, and again, we'll, we'll share all these details so that people can get in touch.
Uh, we thanks for the questions so far from from, from a couple of you. Uh, what we'll do is I, I've got a note of all these questions, and we'll come to them at, at, at the end, and and uh, I'll have a note to, to come back to you Ashna, on those. Um, so thank you very much. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, we'll now move on to the last part of the the event in terms of the speaking part before we move on to questions. Um, so we have uh, Gunorgan and Dylan Fakui. Um, who are both joining us today to talk particularly around uh, Delan's experience um, with the Mitchell Library and a few other things. So uh, now can I pass over to you, Gun, first of all, just to, to um, kick off. Are you are you sharing any slides? No, no, I'll just be speaking. No, that's fine. Well, I mean, we're, we can leave this up, I suppose, if you if you want while, while you're speaking. Oh, that's fine. OK. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. There are some familiar faces. So hello to you all for joining. And thank you for joining today. I'll talk briefly about my experience of working with libraries within the refugee sector in Scotland, and then I'll talk briefly about Dylan to introduce him. So he's quaking in his boots about what I'm going to say about him. I think. Um, so I've been working in the refugee sector in Scotland since 2005 in various roles with Scottish Refugee Council, and then my current role with City of Sanctuary as Scotland and Northern Ireland coordinator. Um, uh, as part of my roles, uh, both as advisor and volunteer coordinator at Scottish Refugee Council, I'm pleased to say that I have always signposted people to libraries. Um, Glasgow is a big dispersal city and we've always had people coming through our doors with various needs and questions. And it's actually remarkable thinking back, putting all the dots together, how many of those needs can start to be addressed with a library system? So as John said earlier, from being able to access the internet, being able to access information, a warm space um, during the day, and a sense of community. And also, I think critically, volunteering and engagement opportunities within libraries as well. And I've, what I've always felt Glasgow Life libraries Put a lot of effort into this and excelled in this as well so i would urge you all to think of not just um, offering welcome but also thinking of the people to come through your to come through your doors as a, as a resource what what people can do for your library as well so i know the glasgow life library system have had multilingual volunteers who are seeking sanctuary offering digital information offering information to other library users and general volunteering roles. Uh, Macquill and Cancer, who've had a partnership within Glasgow Libraries, have always had refugee volunteers offering counselling support uh, to people affected by cancer. So many different engagements are possible. I have mainly referred people for entry into education systems for digital access. And I know colleagues of mine who work with families have always tried to link up new mothers with reading groups, mothers and toddler groups, which all take place within libraries. And that's quite often a new person's entry into Scottish society. There is a tendency, which is sometimes unfortunate, that we, when somebody comes through our doors, they belong to a certain nationality. We will automatically refer them to a community group of that nationality, which is great. But people also want to live and integrate and become part of this new society and libraries are a great place for mixing, meeting and very egalitarian places which I've always enjoyed and I know that my friend and colleague of 10 years, Dylan, will talk about what libraries have meant to him, what libraries have done for him and what his involvement has been and Dylan, I will not go into personal details but uh, I have known Dylan for a long time. And in the early part of uh, that interaction, Dylan was very much subject to the hostile environment that John was talking about earlier. While we in the community and the refugee sector do our best, the environment out, out there for people seeking asylum in the UK, and even people who've been recognized as refugees and have got the right to remain here. It's harsh, it's limiting, it curtails opportunities, it curtails personal ambition and that elusive idea of self-fulfillment. And I think the refugee sector and the libraries together 
can work together count to counteract that. And that's why I see a great role for libraries in there. And I hope Dylan will be able to put some flesh around the bones of what I'm talking about. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Dylan, who was once upon a time a volunteer at Scottish Refugee Council. And I'm pleased to say then a staff colleague at Scottish Refugee Council. Then he left Scotland for the big city of London, but I'm glad he came back. So he has, since coming back to Scotland, founded a new organisation, Refugees for Justice. And I hope you'll find a couple of minutes to talk about what Refugees for Justice does as well, Dylan. So over to you. Thank you so much, Gun. Once Scott, always a Scott. Um, I did. I did come to Scotland. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to be here, um, and thank you for having me. My name is Dylan Futuhi. I came to Scotland in 2013, quite a while ago, to seek sanctuary, and I'm privileged to have been welcomed in Scotland and have having had the opportunity to re-establish a new life in Scotland. So I'm going to speak a, a bit about my personal experience of um uh fleeing home country arriving in a new place and um rebuilding uh, a new life in a new home and the role that libraries played in that journey um in 2013 january 2013 when i came to scotland um the first place that i was accommodated was there used to be high-rise flats in springburn red road flats if you remember then they demolished them um there's quite a lot of asylum seekers there it was an asylum accommodation um so day one of arrival in scotland i um i was accommodated in the red road flat on the 18th floor i remember and on the 28th floor on the top floor there was scottish refugee council's office um, so day two, I was invited to the Scottish Refugee Council for an induction and information session. And I remember my caseworker, the first question that I asked my caseworker was, um, where can I um, have access to a computer and internet so that I can contact my family and I can um, find out where uh, all the other people are in Glasgow and find out a little bit about the city. And I remember day three of my arrival in Springburn. Um, so, so the main place that the, the first place that my caseworker referred me was the library in Springburn. And day three, I was settled in the library already. That was my um, my daily hub from that point onward. Um, it was really the gateway to my entrance and integration into this new society. Um, so, and I don't go into the detail of um, my own integration journey, how it was, but um, from the first moment of arrival, the library was, was the gateway to access information, to have the means to communicate with um, my family and my friends back home, and um, also to get to know the, the new community that I was about to join. Um, it played a significant role at that point, at that point of entry. Um, and from there, I, um, through that access to all the information and internet and equipment at the library in Springburn, I then started finding out um, all the available opportunities and resources that exist for me to then start to integrate. I had a huge amount of energy at that time, and I still do, um, but I remember I had a huge amount of energy and hope an aspiration for my new life to rebuild here. But at the same time, I was under a huge amount of pressure by the system. Um, I wanted to volunteer. I wanted to work again. Um, I wanted to study again. Um, uh, I had a lot of plans, but I had a lot of barriers at the same time. Um, libraries, library was the place where I could really sit down and pursue my plans and find the information that I need to then pursue those plans uh, and those hopes and, and dreams. Um, I eventually got my refugee status um, and I was moved from the Red Road Flats to, um, so I became homeless um, uh, unintentionally, but that's the journey that everybody goes through when you are 
an asylum seeker, you're subject to the hostile environment, you, you, know, you don't have enough money at all, and uh, you're excluded from many, many, many public services and mainstream support. Um, but then when you get refugee status, um, those systemic discriminations are uh, removed, but there's still a lot of challenges ahead. So, so namely, in my experience, when I got my refugee status, I was homeless for about a year. And I was in a, I remember Kingston Hall uh, hostel, a homeless accommodation bed and breakfast for a year. Um, that year was quite tough, but it was quite fruitful. Uh, and mainly because, um, because of the way that I started through a Springburn library and then to Mitchell library. So that year of homelessness um, in, Mich in um, Kingston Hall Hotel, um, I remember I met Gun on the third month of my uh, arrival in Scotland and I started volunteering with Gun at Scottish Refugee Council. And I wanted to learn English because I wanted to start studying again. Um, so I was introduced to Mitchell library that year of me being homeless, um, literally half of my days were spent in Mitchell Library to study English. I wanted to um, take an IELTS course to be able to study again. Um, so half of my days every day were spent in Mitchell Library to, uh, to study English. I ha had access to many, many resources that I didn't know exist. Um, IELTS books, internet access every day at the cafe in Mitchell Library, um, uh, doing mock tests online, accessing books, etc. But also I met many good friends at the, at the cafe, including Scottish friends and, and people from um, Middle East uh, that I could relate to. And some of them are my best friends now. Uh, those were everlasting connections that I made in, in Mitchell Library. And then I learned that there are so many other um, books and resources and uh, things that I could access in Mitchell Library. So it became my home um, or, or the gateway to my new home. Um, those two mechanisms, accessing uh, all the resources and, and equipments and internet and computer at Mitchell Library. Uh, knowing uh, all the other connections that I could build through the library, meeting all the new friends that I met at the Mitchell Library Cafe. And it's still my favorite place to, to go and have a coffee with my friends, and I still go. Um, and then that personal experience was translated into slightly more professional experience. So I started working in a paid capacity at the Refugee Council, and um, I, I worked with my fellow refugees and asylum seekers who were volunteering with me on a peer support program. So we had other groups of new arrivals um, that we used to run peer support sessions in our own native language about um, how to access services, how to do volunteering, how to do a job application. And at the beginning, we started doing those sessions in the Scottish Refugee Council conference room. And <laughs> we all agree that it's quite a boring and uh, dry environment to do peer peer connection sessions in a conference room. So uh, almost instantly, we started doing those conversations in libraries rather than in a, in a conference room. And libraries were open uh, and welcoming to those groups of, of new arrivals who sit down over a coffee together and talk about how to access information, how to access services, how to volunteer, and learning about the new community. Um, and uh, I witnessed firsthand that there were so many incredible connections made in, in that context of refugees and asylum seekers coming together using the space and the premises of the library, using internet connection, et cetera, to build those connections. And, uh, and, and very soon those, those peer discussions became mixed of, uh, you know, participants became mixed of refugees, asylum seekers and Scottish people. Um, so it was incredible to see how libraries can can enable that social connection um, and I continue that model I'm going to cut it short but but it's still uh, so my, my work involves a lot of community organizing and community work and and, and libraries are a place where um, we still go and uh, sit down for a coffee either informal or even in the context of our work we sit down for um, a, a peer support session in the in, in the library rather than doing it in a in an office environment, and it's incredible to see the result of that. There is, the result is much more uh, 
positive and organic and natural and real when 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 you use the, the premises um, of library and the equipment so it has played a significant role in my life and i've seen it firsthand how it could be beneficial to everyone else um, to summarize or, or to finish um, i want to uh, make this a bit more relatable in terms of in terms of feelings and in terms of the real lived experience feeling of being a refugee. Um, there's a beautiful poem that I want to read for you. It's from, it's a, it's a very short one. Uh, Banu Kapil uh, is, is a wonderful poet. And, and a part of, uh, she's got a book called How to Wash a Heart. And, and in one of her poems, she says, um, she says, it's exhausting to be a guest in somebody else's house forever even though the host invites the guest to say whatever it is they want to say, the guest knows that host logic is variable. And it goes on, but it's wonderful for me because being a refugee in a, you know, the experience of fleeing home and arriving in a new community and trying to rebuild life there, the experience of being a refugee is exactly from the same substance of the experience of being a guest uh, in somebody else's house. And so the question is, how, do, how would you make a guest feel home? Uh, what, what are the experiences that a guest can have in order to feel home? It's a beautiful metaphor. For me, when I'm a guest somewhere, I think I, think I feel home. There, there are specific components that it, it makes me feel home. Once it's that, one of them is that I have my own private room, that's my room, that's my house. And I have access to the same rights that the host has access to. So I have the same rights, but also very critically, importantly, um, I also have access to all the com communal places like the living room and the corner of the you know, bookshelf and the, and the kitchen and the toilet and the bathroom. The moment I have my toothbrush in the, in the bathroom, I have a place for my toothbrush. And the moment that I have that I sit down, like now libraries in this metaphor or that, or that cozy corner with a nice chair and a beautiful bookshelf that you can sit down and gaze towards the window and, and read a book and have a cup of coffee and chat with the host and, and others. That's the place. And the moment that I feel confident to use that space, and very importantly, the moment that I add my picture frames and, and objects and books to the bookshelf of that library, of that space in the house, that's when I feel home. And I think libraries are those places that um, are open and welcoming to people. And, and we could be more intentional to make them more open and more welcoming, welcoming to people, but also make sure that um, they are inclusive and they are, uh, you know, they include, so that they're, they're not, uh, they're not a place that, that, that people feel like a guest, but they're a place where people can add their own skills and talents and objects and, and cultural uh, heritage to the library so that, so that they, they feel that shared ownership of the common places. Um, this has been very much my experience and I really, really appreciate your efforts to, uh, to continue this, this culture and to continue this welcoming culture in the libraries. That's all from me. Thank you, Dylan. That, that, that was incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We really appreciate that. And uh, if ever there was a, a reason to show the uh, vital importance of libraries within a community that no other service provides, then, then that, that, that story absolutely showed that in terms of just informal connections, but also that that ability to be able to, to, to learn and upskill and, and, and things like that. And, and fantastic to hear that, that Glasgow um, Life and Glasgow Libraries was, was able to do that. So thank you so much to you and, and Gun for sharing your, your, your uh, information stories today. Um, and thanks to all our contributors. We have a few questions. Um, so I'll, um, if uh, I may come to you to, to uh, unmute if you don't mind, if you want to ask, ask a question, I think, uh, first question we had, I think, was when you you were speaking, Ashley. Um, Martin, are you able to, to unmute and just, just the, the question around around trauma trauma inducing or trauma reducing? Would, would you mind? Yeah, I'm just conscious that kind of I'm a social worker, and so when I'm in offices, there's so much information on walls that kind of like we sometimes forget that actually 
it's actually inducing trauma or stress than it is reducing. So I'm always conscious that kind of like we need to take down all these horrible pictures of, of, of trauma and horrible pictures of uh, women that have been abused and not show necessarily the faces. Now I know that I appreciate the importance of visualization, but not with trauma. Thank you. Thank you, and and I assume that, that these are the kind of things that the the city of sanctuary will will actually will 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 help with if, if libraries are thinking around how to make the the, the journey for for people within that that space. I think that's something like, and it's a, a bit embedded in the the mentality that we're uh, a place of sanctuary and a place of welcome. So we're not using the stories of how people got here as part of that, but just more about creating welcome. So not posting about the conflicts and things like that, that may be triggering for people that have trauma, um, but to just more be a space and tell those stories of welcome and community can definitely be a part of it that doesn't have to address the trauma. Thank you. Um, the, the next question, I think, uh, maybe come back to, to you, you, Ashley, or, or, or Gun, perhaps. Um, the Western Isles Isle libraries, uh, very small and, uh, and remote, um, but would, would still be very keen to, to apply. Uh, so it's so a smaller service like that, that, that's perhaps a little bit out of the way, but will we'll still have, have some of the same um, need. Uh, would you still see a value in applying? Is there any advice you've got for maybe starting that journey? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it doesn't matter the size of the library or if you even have, you may not have people seeking sanctuary that come to your library, but I think it's still important because you do have people coming and it's all about like the hearts and minds of people to be around welcome and inclusion. And so no matter the size, I think being a library of sanctuary is important. It also puts numbers to the movement that, you know, this many libraries are all supporting sanctuary and welcome is important in the advocacy side of it. And with smaller libraries, that's why I was saying we can do different things for that programming, especially if you don't actually know that you have any sanctuary seekers that you are servicing in the library. I mean, it can just be about creating the idea of welcome for the patrons and things like that and the issues around that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the ne next question we, we have uh, is around specialist libraries. Dawn, I know you're maybe on, on your phone, so I don't know if you're able to, to unmute, but do, do you want to maybe say what, what type of library you particularly work in, just, just to add some, some context there? But, but I think the question is really about, you know, obviously this is very much focused on public libraries, but is there other ways that, that, that perhaps more specialist libraries can contribute? Hi there, yeah, I don't, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, super. Excellent. So, sorry, due to technical problems, I am having to do this on my own mobile phone, so I do apologise. Um, I actually work for Historic Environment Scotland. I appreciate that will not be obvious um, due to me being on my phone. Um, and we do have a, a small specialist library. We have a large archive, things like that. Um, so, you know, we aren't a public library and I can see very much how public libraries fit into it. And I think probably we could as well. It's possibly just not quite as clear for, for libraries like mine. And I wonder if there's any advice on, on that at all. I think I would um, have to defer to John on that one. Um, I think that there's definitely a, a, a need for it and of interest, but um, how you would actually go about that within your programming would probably be more of a John question. <laughs> And that could be a conversation offline between you and John and I about what your your institution looks like and how we can make that work for the award process. I completely agree with Ashley. Thank you. Yeah, I think it would be terrific to have a, a conversation maybe separately. Um, most of my experience has been working with public libraries uh, that have um, been working towards or achieving library of sanctuary status. Um, and I've done some work with school libraries and been in touch with some colleges, but I'm really interested in widening that out. So maybe if um, you, Dawn, and um, Ashley and I could have a conversation, we could actually see where this goes next. I'd be really keen to do that. Yes, if the two of you would be uh, amenable to that, I'd be really excited to do that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and yeah. I'll I'll join in that conversation as well. That's okay. Oh, yeah. thank you. Scotland How wonderful! <laughs> Super. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks all, and, and thanks, Don, for the question. 
the next next bit was was just when, when you were speaking, Dylan. Uh, Martin, you, you had a couple of questions. First, firstly, you know what what were some of the things or items that made you feel uh, welcome and and safe after after your journey to Scotland and uh, when you first arrived? Uh, Martin, I might get you to just clarify when you you mentioned language line. What you, what you mean by that? Sorry, I, 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 I perhaps missed that. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm not working in libraries, but kind of like I am a social worker, and so I used to have difficulties uh, uh, communicating and obviously uh, getting information. And so, kind of like I've had in the past access to language line, but I'm just wondering how, when people first come in, how is it that they can connect and communicate? Uh, but uh, Dylan, you did cover some of the other question with the fact that having your own place to put your tooth toothbrush, a chair, and a safe place to to be. Uh, at home was was a great answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, if anyone else can, can help out with the second part of the question, feel free to, to add it to the to the chat. Uh, now the next part was uh, Alice Nicol, who works for for Glasgow Libraries. Um, so just uh, in terms of library resources, and this is this is for you, Dylan. Um, is there anything you wished that uh, had been able to provide, which, which wasn't there? You know, now now from your experience, that that might that, that might inform um, future services, not just Glasgow, but but el elsewhere. And also, just thanks for sharing. It's wonderful to hear how welcoming the libraries were for you. Of course, so just a brief um, reflection. Uh, it's not directly related to resources, but um, uh, I think just something that I noticed that exists a lot further down the line, uh, year three and year four, into, uh, I think it's about multiculturalism and how uh, my experience of libraries, I realized that um, it is, it, it's an open place for everybody to exercise in, uh, and promote and, and share um, whatever culture they come from. Uh, so it exists, it's available. Um, we started using libraries for refugee week events, for example, refugee festival events, for exhibitions, for music events, for um, book launch, etc. And those could be um, any cultural events. But the first encounter with the libraries that I had, like when I was a complete new arrival, um, um, I think if I want to make the work of libraries even more effective than they are now, I would um, make sure that libraries are um, obviously and very uh, um, visibly multicultural spaces. So there are, there are elements of uh, my culture as a Kurdish person from the Middle East in the library that I can see, or there are events that I can participate that are, you know, resonate with my culture as well as the home country's culture, etc. So um, making them as much visibly multicultural places as possible um, would, would, would make it even, even more awesome than they are now. Thank you. Even more awesome. That's that, that's that's a lovely way to put it. Thank you. Um, now, just uh, just looking at the question, there, there, a lot of, of comments are saying thank you to, to, to everyone and thank you to, um, for particularly um, sharing your story. And um, with one person who who who, who asked it, asked not to be named, but just wanted to share their story. Um, uh, they moved to Scotland in 2014, not knowing English, uh, not having friends or family, and wanted to say that what you said, Dylan, resonated a lot. Went to the library soon after they arrived, and and um, eventually found a job, um, a job in the in the library. And um, people in that library trusted them and gave them a chance, and couldn't be more grateful. Met lots of wonderful people, found the resources they needed, and the space that they needed. Um, they're now now back at, at, at their home country, but hoping to come back to the UK. And and just to say thank you for sharing, Dylan, and and the, the very much a similar experience. Of, of the library service that, that they accessed at the time. Um, so I think the the rest, I think, are mainly just comments saying thank you very much. Um, last chance if anyone else wants to add a, a, a final question. Um, I know there's been other links shared and, and I'll um, save the chat here so, so that um, we don't miss any links. Um, if anyone, if I've missed anyone's question or comment, do you want to just raise your hand and I can come to you um, just before we finish up? If you had a couple of a few seconds to do that if you want um, you can go to uh, reactions at the bottom of the screen and, and raise your hand if you wanted to say anything else before we finish up 
Okay, no, I think that, that's everything. Um, but yeah, the, there's other comments saying that FE libraries could partner with public libraries to extend information. Absolutely, I think FE libraries, the further education college libraries have a role in communities, which a lot of the time can be very similar to public libraries as the place that, 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 that people are often referred to as a, as a place to find some of that initial uh, learning. And, and I think that's a, a very important point. And uh, Edinburgh University Library publicises a list of books on migration for refugee festival Scotland each year, as well as creating a visible display. So that's something to, to check out as well. Uh, so other than that, I just want to say thank you to all our participants today. Thank you to John, thank you to Ashley, thank you to Goon, and thank you to Delan for all sharing your information stories. We really appreciate it. This has been really inspiring and informative, and, and hopefully there's people here who can follow up on, on some of this and, and, and take things take things forward. Um, so thanks again, and we will share the recording soon. Um, and hopefully you all have a nice Friday and lovely weekend and see you again soon. Thank you.